that's pretty good. Advent is a season of joy. We celebrate the coming of Christ's child with parties, with gifts, special decorations. We even, we even buy new clothes. We gather with family and friends for special events. We honor long-held traditions. We also reach out to those whose joy is dimmed this season. This morning, we have lit the third candle of the Advent wreath. That is the candle of joy. For Christ is indeed our joy. He is coming. And in the words of the psalmist, Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures evermore. Brothers and sisters, the joy of the Lord is our strength. So let us rejoice in the joy of Christ's presence as we join together in our call to worship. Walking toward Bethlehem, this is the never step of the way. For the sound of our name, for the announcement that we have found favor with God, we journey toward Bethlehem, watching every step of the way. For a new star in the sky, for guidance in our daily lives. Walking toward Bethlehem, Sensing we are not alone. Angels all around us. The prayers of saints surround us. We journey toward Bethlehem. Hoping we shall find a baby in a manger. A simple sign that God loves us still. And reason enough to sing God's praise. Let us pray. Creator and giver of all good gifts, as we come together for worship this morning, we pray that you would open our eyes so that we could see with a clear vision all those mighty works of yours that are around us. Unstop our ears so that we can hear the sound of your living water that is bubbling up through those, those parched places in our lives. Give us strength so that we can leap with joy at the good news of salvation that, that comes to us in the Christ child. Open our mouths that our singing might express our rejoicing as we gather with hope of a new creation that you have set before us. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I just have one personal note that I want to uh, uh, speak to you uh, about this morning. Uh, getting close to Christmas time always tends to make me a little nostalgic. Uh, and I think back over the last six years uh, that I've been here. And when I say six years, it doesn't seem like it's been uh, six years. It does, the, the time has gone by uh, very, very quickly. And I just wanted to take a moment this morning to express to you my gratitude for uh, for you all. Uh, just for you being who you are. Uh, and it has made my service here during these six years a very uh, pleasant experience. And so I want to wish you from my wife and from my grandchildren, I uh, want to wish you all a, a very Merry Christmas and hope that this is your best Christmas ever. If you ask most people what uh, Advent is about or if you ask them to uh, associate the word Advent with the very first thing that pops into their head, most people will say Christmas. Very few people will say Incarnation. And yet that's really what Advent is all about. As we retell that Christmas story year after year after year, of what it is about, it's about the Incarnation. It is about the Word becoming flesh. It's about God uh, from His place of transcendence uh, coming and limiting himself to what it means to be a human being, coming to us. And we marvel at that. We marvel that God would come to us as a small baby here to live on this planet. Because you and I both know that we learn as human beings very, very early that, uh, that, the, that this world is a painful place to live. It's an uncertain place to live. It's hard here. It's lonely. Sometimes it seems a little meaningless. Our spirits get cold, our hearts lose hope too easily, and it's painful sometimes when we love too much or we care too much. And so we wait anxiously for the birth of that promised one who, who promised to turn all of our darkness into light, to remove that dreaded sting of death as we uh, have birthed within us these uh, the sense of eternal life. As God's church, we know that we often have been the cause of God's pain because of our impatience, because of our giving in to a sense of hopelessness. And so this morning we confess our sins before him and we seek his forgiveness. Merciful Savior, in our rush to Christmas joy, we confess that, like our culture, we would prefer to skip Advent's invitation to stillness, reflection, in preparation. Shiny wrappings and ornaments are far more festive than looking at the ways we fall short of the call to be your people. Holiday parties and shopping conveniently blind us to the poverty of those who will celebrate your birth with neither tree nor gifts. Our busyness numbs us to the despair felt by many during this time of year. Thank you for your faithful prophet Malachi, whose voice pierces our self-absorbed revelry with the truth that we need to face. We are lost. We are broken. 
We need you. Come, Lord Jesus, come into our hearts with mercies new this morning, grace sufficient for this day, forgiveness that cleanses us from our guilt and sin. We gratefully receive the Christ child again. God has made a highway in the wilderness and brought forth streams in the desert. Jesus Christ came to break down the walls that divide us from God and from each other. So you are free to reach out into love for in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. <clears throat> Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Compassionate God, in this time of darkness that we experience, sometimes we wait for the one that's going to come and redeem us. As we enjoy the merriment of the season, as we, as we marvel at the sparkle of the decorations, we need to remember that there are those among us, there are those in our community for whom this holiday season is not one of joy and good cheer. It is these this morning that we lift up as we pray. We pray this morning for Christian Willard, for Joe, for Wanda, uh, for Bill, and for Don. We also pray, Lord, that you would uh, guide the birth of this new life that is about to come into this world, that you would uh, that you would bring it forth as uh, with the true working of your miracle power as you always have. Father, we pray today for those that can't see the light in the darkness. It is our prayer that they would find hope, not in all the tinsel and the commercial side of Christmas, but rather in the promise of that Christ child that comes. We pray for those who are grieving this Advent season that maybe this is that very first year, uh, very first Christmas after they've lost someone they love. May they find your comfort and hope in the promise of your resurrection. We pray for those that struggle to feel joy because uh, they're mired in mounting bills. They are despairing for a lack of employment. May they be granted faith that you would provide. In addition, we pray for all of our military families that are separated by great distance from their loved ones who are serving uh, some in harm's way uh, halfway across the world tables that have an empty seat this Christmas, may they rely upon you for their strength and protection. We pray for those who have family dynamics that make times of the year like this not a time of joy, but rather one that's filled with stress and anger. May your grace enter in in such a way that hearts can be softened, all those old hurts can be let go of, that a door somehow might be open to reconciliation. We lift all of our joys and give them, give over all of our concerns to you, those that we have spoken, those that remain secret within our hearts. We commend them over into your tender care. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers this morning, for we lift them up to you in the name of the one that taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
Our first lection for this third Sunday of Advent comes from the 35th chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 through 10. Wilderness and desert will sing joyously. The badlands will celebrate and flower like the crocus in spring, bursting in the blossom, a symphony of song and color. Mountain glories of Lebanon, a gift, awesome, caramel, stunning, sharing gifts, God's resplendent glory fully on display. God awesome, God majestic. Energize the limp hands, strengthen the rubbery knees, tell fearful souls, courage, take heart. God is here, right here on his way to put things right and redress all wrongs. He's on his way. He'll save you. Blind eyes will be opened, deaf ears unstopped. Lame men and women will leap like deer. The voiceless will break into song. Springs of water will burst out of the wilderness. Streams will flow in the desert. Hot sands will become an oasis. Thirsty ground, a splashing fountain. Even the lowly jackals will have water to drink. And barren grasslands will flourish richly. Oh, and there'll be a highway called the Holy Road. No one rude or rebellious is permitted on this road. It's for God's people exclusively. It's impossible to get lost on this road. Even a fool can't get lost on this road. No lions on this road, no dangerous wild animals, nothing and no one dangerous or threatened. Only the redeemed will walk on it. The people God has ransomed will come back on this road and they'll sing as they make their way home to Zion and fading halos of joy encircling their head, welcomed home with gifts of joy and gladness as all sorrows and sighs scurry into the night. Our gospel reading comes from the 11th chapter of Matthew, verses 2 through 11. Now, meanwhile, John had been locked up in prison, and when he got wind of what Jesus was doing, he sent his disciples to ask, are, are you the one that we've been looking for, or should we still be waiting? And Jesus said, go back and tell John what's happening here. Blind folks can see, lame folks can walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf can hear, the dead are raised, the wretched of the earth learn that God's on their side. Is this what you were expecting? If so, then count yourselves most blessed. And when John's disciples had left to report, Jesus started talking to the crowd about John. He said, when you came out here, what did you expect to see? A weekend camper? Hardly. Well, then what? A, a, a sheik in silk pajamas? Not in the wilderness, not by a long shot. What then, a prophet? Well, that's right, a prophet. Probably the best prophet you'll ever hear. He is the prophet that Malachi announced when he wrote, I'm sending my prophet ahead of you to make the road smooth for you. Let me, let me tell you what's going on here. No one in history surpasses John the baptizer, but in the kingdom that he is preparing you for, the lowliest person is ahead of him. For a long time now, folks have been getting into the kingdom of God by force. But if you read the books of the prophets and God's law closely, you will see them culminate in John, teaming up with him in preparing the way for the Messiah of the kingdom. When you look at it like this, John is that Elijah that you all have been expecting to arrive and introduce the Messiah. Come, oh, he has come. Oh. 
Let us pray. Gracious God, you've given us your word to enlighten us, to purify us, and yet uh, your ways are sometimes uncomfortable for us. And as we read the scriptures now, may we not be prudish about your words, but rather embrace the fullness of your message. Help us to be open to all the ways that you reach out to us and ready to respond. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. The text which will serve as the foundation for the homily this morning is from the letter of James, chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. Meanwhile, friends, wait patiently for the master's arrival. You see farmers doing that all the time, waiting for their valuable crops to mature, patiently letting the rain do its slow but sure work. Be patient like that. Steady, strong. You see, the master could arrive any time. So friends, don't complain about one another. Far greater complaint could be lodged against you, you know. Judge is standing just around the corner. Take the old prophets as your mentors. 
They put up with anything, went through everything, and never once did they quit. All the time they were honoring God. What a gift life is to those that stay the course. You've heard, of course, of Job's staying power, and you know how God brought it all together for him at the very end. That's because God cares, cares right down to the very last detail. Word of God for the people of God. Any of you that have ever had children, have grandchildren, you know that children are not good at waiting. As it turns out, most of us adults aren't really much better at it anyway. Whether they're waiting for the pediatrician at the doctor's office or waiting for their turn to play with their favorite toy at school, waiting with us maybe in the line at the DMV, waiting for a number to be called, waiting and asking from the back seat of the car. How many times have you heard this question? Are we there yet? All of these are really kind of painful experiences for children, but none of those is quite as bad as that one of waiting for Christmas. Now, when I was growing up, the signal that Christmas was coming was the arrival of the Sears Roebuck toy catalog. I remember that. It would come in the mail, and we were absolutely jubilant, and we would go through that thing within just a couple of hours. The pages would be all sticky and dog-eared and nasty, and, you know, only trouble was it came early enough that it seemed an interminable amount of time between Uh, the time that the Christmas catalog arrived and Christmas actually got there. During that time of Christmas, you see, there's even more waiting than we're accustomed to at any other time. Children are asked to wait in long lines at stores. They're asked to wait uh, for the cookies to cool before they can eat them. They have to wait to have their pictures taken with Santa Claus. They muddle through those last few days of school waiting for that Christmas break to start. And then they suffer with us through delays at airports and in traffic before finally getting to Grandma's house. And all of this in addition to the most difficult wait of all, and that is waiting for that big day to arrive. One of the greatest expressions of children waiting for Christmas has been heard every December, and I'm sure you've already heard it this year. Every December since 1958, when Alvin and the Chipmunks, remember them? They first sang the Chipmunk song. I know you you sitting there like you don't know. I know you heard it. Long after any kid has wanted a plane that loops the loop or a hula hoop for Christmas, Alvin and Simon and Theodore cry, we can hardly stand to wait. Please, Christmas, don't be late. It's a cry that's as relevant today as it was, can it be, 60 years ago? Try as they might, patience at Christmas time is hard for kids. So how do we help our children be patient? How do we teach them patience? Well, experts, of course, have some thoughts on this. You might try modeling patience, which is hard because a lot of us are impatient. You could give your children opportunities to talk about patience or impatience. You might use timers, you know, to help them learn patience. Or you could get kids to do things that require uh, incrementally more amounts of time, and so thus they learn uh, some patience. Teaching patience is a slow process because it requires patience by those of us who are teaching them. And unfortunately, it seems that we are, as a species, we are are hardwired to be impatient. All of us need to be taught how to wait. Now, this text from James hints that just like children who are impatient for Christmas to come, The early church was getting a little bit antsy about Jesus' return. Throughout the entirety of Jesus' ministry, he spoke all and all, uh, over and over again, about how he was going to return for his disciples. One day they were going to live with him in this glorious kingdom, and they, they thought that that was coming like right now. 
You know, like yesterday, remember in Thessalonians where Paul uh, chides the folks there that are so anxious for, for Jesus to return that they quit their jobs and they about all they do just sit around on the front porch all day drinking iced tea and waiting for Jesus to come. They thought Jesus was coming like now, and but after the first generation of the church, with every day that went by, they began to wonder what was keeping him, you know? People were getting impatient. And so this letter of James is written to a church that is struggling with, with that idea of waiting. And so over and over again, he tells them in this text that they need to be patient. In this very brief passage, these few verses, he uses the word patience four different times. Wait patiently for the master's arrival. That's what he says. Reminds the people that this is what they're waiting for. And this is no minor event. This is something pretty major. This is their hope. And so Jesus is well worth whatever weight we have to go through. And then he turns around and he uses the illustration of a farmer that waits very patiently through the fall and the winter for his crops to grow in the spring. Those of you that farm or have farmed, you know that waiting is an awful lot of farming. And then even sometimes after the wait, the uh Crops don't turn out the way they're supposed to. My grandfather used to always say that when a farmer died, he went straight to heaven. And he went straight to heaven, he said, because, and I quote, it'd be a shame to work as a farmer all your life and then die and go to hell. Waiting is a big part of the game. Even, even the most casual gardener knows that there are times as though it appears that nothing is happening in the garden like now. And like the family experts that encourage parents to teach patients by growing plants with their children, James wants the believers in that early church to, to use the patience that they have, uh, that they have learned from farming as they wait for the return of Jesus. And so he encourages the church to hold on to their hope as they wait. He knows that waiting can tempt us to take matters in our own hands. And we do. We feel like God don't know what he's doing. And so we got to get in there and we got to help God. And if you want to screw something up, then you get in there and try to help God sometime. Remember the story of Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament? For 25 years, God had promised uh, Abraham that he was going to have a direct heir, you say, a, direct, a son of his own. Well, Sarah, bless her pointy little head decided that God wasn't acting fast enough. And so she involved her handmaid, Hagar, in the mess. Well, look at the Middle East, and you can kind of see what taking things into your own hands, trying to help God along, what that does. James is encouraging the church. He knows that we can be tempted to rush results when we get impatient. He advises the church not to get, never give up, never give in, but rather to wait patiently for God's timing. And that's not always easy. And then James acknowledges that waiting is painful sometimes. And he refers to the Old Testament prophets. A lot of those prophets suffered emotionally. They suffered psychologically, sometimes even physically, as they waited for the words that God had given them to be fulfilled. So James, ever the practical preacher, never sugarcoats how hard it is to wait. But he still remind, reminds the church that they need to wait, to be patient. Now, as we sit here in our pews today, 2016, we don't have the same expectation of the, of the imminent return of Christ that those early believers had. See, we, we've had nearly 2,000 years of experience of people telling us, oh, the end is near, the end is near, running around like heads with their chicken cut off, and the world never actually comes to an end. In the last few years, we've had televangelists, you know, all over those electric preachers, all over TV telling us that the end is coming uh, on an episode of Hee Haw years ago, you know, when they did that cornfield thing where they'd pop up and they kind of tell jokes. 
Well, they popped up, and Junior Sample uh, said to uh, Grandpa Jones, he says, he says, have you, do you believe that the younger generation is headed to perdition? He said, yes, I do. I believe that now for now on to 90 years. See, we always believe that the end is coming. We've been told that over and over again. The televangelists won't ever let us forget it. And, and remember the, the big flap over the Mayan calendar? Remember that where the world was supposed to come to an end? I always wondered if the Mayans were so smart about predicting things, how, how come they never predicted that they were going to die out? We have politicians and books and movies all telling us that the world is coming to an end. Now, here's the skinny. All those dates have come and gone. For 2,000 years, the church has tried to predict when Jesus is going to return. And for 2,000 years, we have never gotten it right. We are 100% wrong. Do you realize that as far as predicting the return of Jesus, we have a 100% failure rate? It's true. Jesus has not returned yet. And here we are, still here, waiting patiently. We may not feel the same urgency that those early Christians felt about the return of Jesus. We do know, however, that there have been times in our lives when we've had circumstances or situations that occurred where we prayed and it seemed that God took a long time to give us a response, whether that was in a hospital room or maybe in a nursing home, maybe in the middle of the night when we were wrestling with some, some big problem within our lives, we prayed for Jesus to bring healing to our family members, strengthen our friends to bring peace in our lives. We've cried out from the very depths of our hearts, please, Jesus, don't be late. And through it all, James reminds us that we have to be patient. But, you see, God's idea, the Bible's idea of patience is a little bit different from the way we think about patience normally. There's a website called WikiHow, and it claims to be a place where you can learn to do anything. And it offers tips on a wide variety of, of topics. At WikiHow, you can learn how to get rid of your back pain or, or how to breed canaries or, or write a screenplay. There is a section on the website entitled Christmas for Kids, which in, contains articles about how kids uh, teach kids how to write a letter to Santa Claus or, or how to snoop for presents under the Christmas tree without, you, without your folks finding out and how to draw pictures of the baby Jesus. One story that they have advises on how to wait for Christmas morning. And a lot of the suggestions that WikiHow gives involves the act of being distracted. What they recommend is tiring yourself out before going to bed on Christmas Eve, reading a book, listening to music, making a list, writing in a journal. In other words, doing things that kind of take your mind off Christmas Day. The idea is to occupy your mind with something other than Christmas. I remember growing up, mom and dad always put a curfew on us. They said that we couldn't get up on Christmas morning before 6.30. Couldn't get a, my brother, and I remember this, my brother Doug, I can remember seeing him sitting up in the middle of the bed looking at his watch. From the time we went to bed until 6.30, and I guarantee you, at 6.30 on the dot, he was up. But see, the idea here is to be distracted, to, to, to do things that take your mind off of that. If we focus on something other than you see what's about to happen uh, and try to do them uh, like we do every other day, then it, the premise is that time goes by faster. Other suggestions, however, encourage children to do just exactly the opposite. Rather than trying to forget that Christmas is coming, they are advised to enter more fully into the Christmas season. In other words, embrace it. And these ideas include things like helping mom and dad decorate the Christmas tree or uh, wrapping gifts, decorating, uh, uh, maybe helping mom uh, bake cookies in the kitchen, uh, getting Santa's snack ready, things like that. These activities don't just pass the time. But, and here's the method to my madness in case you're wondering where I'm going with this, these involve the child in the preparation itself. They allow kids to enter into the day to come. It's not Christmas yet, but 
we remember that Christmas is coming by doing Christmas things today. And this is the very kind of patience that James is talking about to the early church. We usually think of waiting as being something passive, as patience being a passive thing. But he's not telling them to wait passively, not to distract themselves while they try to pass the time until Jesus returned. Instead, he's calling the church to enter into that day of the coming kingdom of God by living the kingdom today. The examples James gives of kingdom living really are very simple ones. I don't know why sometimes we try to make the gospel a lot more complicated than it is. He says, while you are waiting, don't grumble with one another. Don't complain about your brothers and sisters. Be patient and loving and caring with one another. Now, that's simple enough, isn't it? Why do we have such a hard time doing that? Advent is our countdown to Christmas. We light the candles on the Advent wreath every Sunday. And every time we light one, <coughs> excuse me, it marks how our, our celebration of the arrival of light, the world, draws near. Some of you growing up, maybe even some of your families now, have the, have the old-timey Advent calendars that serve as reminders for children, and it shows them how many sleeps are there are until Christmas Day. Advent is about waiting. Advent is about preparing for Jesus. And, and the Jesus story, brothers and sisters, is not over. See, we live in a weird time. We, we live in that time between uh, Jesus ushering in the kingdom of God and it arriving in its fullness when he, re when he returns. As we prepare to celebrate that glorious gift of his coming to us on that first Christmas morning, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, we also remember that we are called to wait patiently and to prepare for the coming of Jesus again. Now, sometimes the wait is for Jesus' healing hand to arrive into the brokenness of our lives. In these times, James, once again, relevant. Be patient, he writes, and we strive to live as those who have already been made whole. See, that's really the key. There are other times that we wait for Jesus to return to make the world what it was intended to be, which is a reflection of God's grace and love. Again, the advice of James is be patient and seek to live as those who are already citizens of the kingdom of God. It is a time of patient waiting, a time of preparation, a time to remember. It is during this season that we cry out with our children, please, Christmas, don't be late. I remember the very first time my parents left me alone when they went somewhere. My brothers were younger than I was, so they took them with it, left, allowed me to stay home by myself. And so here I thought I was pretty, that was pretty big doings. And so I kind of mentally calculated when they were going to get back, and I didn't have much trouble until that time came and it went, and there was no sign of them. So I, I started to get a little worried. See, I could hear cars going up and down the road, and I would listen. And, uh, once in a while, one would slow down, and but it would go on by. After a while, I started dreaming up all these weird scenarios that might happen, you know, like they got hit by an asteroid or abducted by aliens. You know, what if something happened to them? What if there had been an accident? What if they weren't coming home? What if they didn't come home tonight? What if they never came home? And so I wound up kind of just sitting by the window, just absolutely paralyzed with fear, hardly able to believe it when eventually their car turned into the driveway. It stopped. Mom and Dad got out laughing, safe and sound after having a, a good evening out and puzzled, amazed that I had been so anxious. Now, I suspect that when Jesus finally appears, a lot of us are going to have that same sense that I did then. When it finally happens, we're going to be, we're going to say, how could we have been so foolish as to doubt? How in the world could we think that just because it was later than we expected and hoped that it might never come at all? 
Every generation of Christians has prayed that Jesus would come like he promised. And so far, every generation has had to learn that lesson of patience. We have to learn that lesson of patience. And it is in patience that we enter into the very presence of Christ with us every single day. Living as though his return has already happened. Patience is not is not grumbling about our brothers and sisters because we know that there's a better day to come. Patience is trusting that our struggle is in Jesus' hands, even though we can't see how it's ever going to turn out. Patience is living today as if Christmas had already come, as if Jesus already has returned. And so patiently we wait and we prepare and we say, please, Jesus, don't be late. Let us pray. Dear God, troubled and confused in a confusing and troubled world, we we try to make sense out of all the conflicting voices that we hear. We search to find one word that will make sense and give meaning to all the rest. We know that true joy is never going to be found in tinsel and colored lights and even less in the excesses of the season. True joy is found in you and you alone. So touch our hearts, touch our souls, enfold your life around ours. Speak that one cleansing, unifying word. Express yourself to us, in us, through us. Bring us the gift of your joy in your life. Amen. Intelligent belief dares to ask questions. True faith allows for honest doubt. Expect attacks and resistance when you question any status quo, religious, political, cultural, family, even your own assumptions. Follow Christ on the path inside your heart no matter where that leads. Live your faith as though it matters. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.